my name, so I could say that, you know, actually, because it is my name, I could say, no, I, I pronounce it in a special way. Because some people do that, there you know. Go. They'll pronounce like, Robert, uh, like Goulette in the last... Um, yeah, like I Goulette guess. or uh, I can't remember. Oh, you know, there is that show. What is it? Keeping Up With Appearances? BBC show? Oh. Where their name is Bucket and she says, it's Bouquet. <laughs> That's like sharp shopping at Target. Yeah, Target. Target. Yeah. So, um, so I could say that. But the other problem is I can't roll my R's. My my mouth is is not built that way. Oh, so you were born with the wrong last name. I can't do it. You know, that's as close as I can get. I can't do it. I've tried all my life. So I apologize. I hope it doesn't offend anybody. But it, the only person it should have, it should anger is myself, I guess. If if that's right, I would be the only one getting mad. Hey, you're pronouncing my name wrong. So um, angry enough at yourself already. Yeah. So yeah. And actually, I'm cool. And it, you know, it's so funny. Someone was just saying that yesterday. Oh, Mark, Mark D'Antonio was in town. Uh, he spoke for Phoenix Mufon, and we were hanging out last night, and he was laughing about how someone who runs the local Mufon calls me Alejandro, and a lot of people do. I have a coworker here that does, and he was laughing because he can say Alejandro, and uh, I'm like, yeah, even though I've known these people for years, they've always said Alejandro. And uh, I don't mind, you know. What I, I know who they re reference, and they're not doing it to me mean. So whatever they want, I am fine with. Yeah. Anybody ever do that with you? Call you Martine? <laughs> no. Uh, Martine? No, I, I'm called Marty. It's funny. Marty, uh, uh, by all the childhood people that I run across, including family, and then, you know, Martin as I got older. So I, I don't even care. Whatever. Yeah. yeah, me too. Of I'm course. like, whatever. They don't have to roll the... the. It's no rolling in my Martin Willis. Oh, but Alejandro means red, I believe. Rojas and... means red. Oh, that's what I meant. Rojas, yeah. Rojas is Martin like... Red. And um, Martin means uh, god of Mars. So the red planet. Oh, yeah. God. So there's some type of connection. Uh, maybe we should be the first volunteers to live on Mars. Part yeah. of that group. Well, Alejandro is like the defender of mankind or something like that, I heard. Defender of mankind, red. Yeah. Huh? And red, Mars is a red planet. So I guess I'm, you are like going to be in charge of Mars, and I'm going to be like your uh, head of the military, I guess, where I'll be defending Defense. Mars. Defense Department. Yeah. yeah. That's All right. cool. That's going to be fun. Like plan. Yeah. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Um, which reminds me, uh, you know, uh, that's cool. This is something cool, and this is this is pertinent. You know, if people are starting to get upset because they want us to talk about UFOs and space and stuff, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> this will be a good segue. Um, I I got invited. I I get invited once in a while um, by this uh, company that promotes science and film uh, to go fly to places and, you know see these interviews or sometimes they'll set me up with interviews so I've inter had interviews with you know movie makers and and script writers and stuff uh, hopefully some of you have seen some of those blogs and stuff that I, I usually they're usually blogs for the Huffington Post but if I can get these people to talk about UFOs then I'll do a story on open minds uh, and sometimes I do uh, in fact I've had uh, the script writer for uh, that uh, uh, Will Smith's and his son, that movie they did on the show because uh, he was into UFOs and stuff a bit. But anyway, uh, they invited me to go to, I think it's going to be uh, Johnson Space Center hmm. uh, next week. And it, it they're going to do a kind of a press conference. It's going to be about the Martian. Um, maybe this is probably, you know, helping to ramp up some excitement uh before the academy awards because i think now is when they're all vying and and trying to market themselves to win awards mm -hmm. and uh so i'm going to get out there and i'm going to be able to meet some astronauts i'm going to be able to see oh, the goodness. rover the next mars rover i'm going to get to uh wear a, a nasa space suit like 
I don't think a whole suit, but like their jumpsuits. Um, wow. And uh, yeah, and I'm gonna get to interview some astronauts and stuff, so uh, people can look forward to that. If you go to my Facebook or my Twitter, this is gonna be December second and third. Uh, I'll be tweeting pictures because you know that's part of what they want us to do, which I'm cool with. So I'll be tweeting pictures of of everything that I'll be doing, and uh, then there'll be a force coming article in the Huffington Post. And if I can get an astronaut to talk about UFOs, uh, then I'll do a story in Open Minds. And hopefully I will, because, of course, there's this Scott Kelly picture um, and some other things. In fact, we'll talk about that in the news a little bit. Um, in Boy, I'm insanely jealous. That is so awesome. Yeah, it's. I am really excited because I didn't go to go to the last one. I was busy where they did something similar at the for the launch of the Martian, and Ridley Scott was there, mm. and I was so looking forward to the launch of the Martian. I was really excited about the news. Uh, I am, of course, a Ridley Scott fan, and uh, I didn't get to. Uh, to do that one, unfortunately. So I'm excited to do this one. Uh, we'll also get to watch a rocket launch. So this is going to be wow. cool. So I'll be posting some stuff about that. Yeah, neat, huh? That is great. Wow. So, so who's the guest today? Yeah, that's that's a good idea to uh, mention uh, the guest. So you can tell you're a professional at these <laughs> nah. UFO podcasts. Um, my guest is Lee Spiegel. Oh. Again. Yeah. He's the guest I've had the most, but... Uh, The reason I've got Lee on this time is because Lee was able to work with his friend Jacques Vallée, who doesn't do UFO conferences uh, like ever, and so he was able to get Jacques Vallée to come speak at uh, the UFO Congress. So, in fact, it's going to be kind of like the Bob Lazar thing where um, Saturday night uh, Lee will be doing a QA and a conversation on the stage with Jacques Vallée. And so um, this is extremely exciting. That and is great news for, for uh, February. Yeah, really cool. And for people who don't know, because I don't know if you've ran across this, but there are some people who don't know who Jacques Vallée is. Well, you know, he's he's been at it so long mm-hmm. and um, not, not, not in the limelight a lot. But um, people that have been around or look into the subject know he's been – you know he he's come up with some great thoughts and ideas and books, many great books over the years, all the way back to the late 60s, I believe, right? Yeah. So this is what's exciting about Jacques. Jacques was the uh, protege, I, I like to put it, I think, uh, of oh, yeah. uh, J. Allen Hynek. So right. Hynek, of course, was a astronomer at uh, several universities, but most prominent or most well known for working at Northwestern. And it was there that he met Jacques. So Heineck was a, a consultant for the U.S. Air Force all the way from like 47 to 69 on UFOs. And uh, Jacques used to think that the whole thing was ridiculous. I mean, uh, Heineck used to think the whole thing was ridiculous. But as time went on, he saw these great cases. And he saw there really was something to this phenomena. And the rest of his life, he looked into it and tried to push for, uh, you know, serious study of the UFO phenomena. I, I think, you know, a lot of people credit him as that kind of like the grandfather of, of ufology. He started modern UFO research. Um, well, and, you know, you interviewed Mark Rodiger, who is the current president of KUFOS, which uh, Heineck started, the Center for UFO Studies. Um, so, and we've talked a lot about Mark lately, that Heineck started. Well, Valet was a student of Hynix at Northwestern, an astronomer, uh, astronomy student, and they partnered up and uh, they wrote some books together. Valet took this on himself. What I love about Valet is that he tackles the phenomena in a real big picture sense. He uh, doesn't filter he doesn't look at UFOs and look at a phenomena of extraterrestrials coming to Earth. He looks at mysterious phenomena overall, trying to get the big picture, taking in all of the data and uh, demonstrating that there's, there's so much strangeness going on. We don't know what the heck mm. is, is going on. You know, he, he tries to push this idea 
that we don't know there's aliens coming here or extraterrestrials coming here and and people get frustrated with that you know him saying that now when I interviewed him I did kind of pin him down and he didn't want to go there because he likes to push this idea which I think is really important that there could be other things going on but he did admit to me that you know he did believe that some of this he said some of this he, he was pretty certain is extraterrestrial in nature so um, he mm -hmm. does believe that people like to say oh he doesn't even believe in aliens but he does uh, at least he told me that mm -hmm. and I've got it on on audio so <laughs> but uh, yeah and ballet's written a lot of books towards this uh, Passport to Magonia is one of his really popular ones. Mm. Um, he's just got uh, Anatomy of a Phenomena, Dimensions, Revelations, all kinds of great books. So he's been around for decades. In fact, in Close Encounters, Truffaut the, uh, is based on him. Well, Lee and I are going to talk a lot more about him. But yeah, just an extremely important guy. He then became a computer scientist and a venture capitalist. He's done very well for himself, so he doesn't need to rely on his book sales or ufology so he doesn't really associate with the ufo field or at least you know the conferences and stuff but he is good friends i found not only with lee but with george knapp and with uh doug trumbull who is of course the famous wow. um and uh incredible uh um special effects artist who worked on, uh, well, with speaking of Ridley Scott, he worked on um, Blade Runner. Uh, he worked on Close Encounters. Um, and he's worked on a lot of 2001, the most important stuff. And, of course, he's working with Mark D'Antonio uh, Trumbull. Yep. Uh, so, and Mark talked about that. And we've interviewed, you've probably interviewed Mark about UFOTOG and their project. Oh, yeah, about just UFO. a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact. Yeah. So, so ah, You were on the show, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You were at his yeah. house. <laughs> That's right. I was at his house. In yeah. his bunker. So, yeah, so very, very excited about Valet. And uh, so Lee and I will talk about that. And we were going to talk some UFO news, but we just didn't have time. We got so into Valet and the con other conference kind of stuff. Be oh, so that's why I'm here. You guys didn't get a chance to talk about news. Well, you know, you and I talk about the latest news anyway. So I knew we'd have some news to talk about Um Regardless of whether and I, Lee and I got into some news. So, ah. and speaking of, let's go ahead and talk some news. And I'm going to go first, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead. And uh, the Scott Kelly thing, I didn't even write a story on it because this is what's kind of funny. And I know Lee is writing a story on it, but um, you know there are these people, and I won't mention names, who are looking at stuff on Mars and every picture from NASA and every type of little thing they can't understand what it is they're claiming it's a UFO and an alien spaceship and I wouldn't mind if they're like hey this is weird what do you guys think I think that's valid I think that's great when people do that because then we can all talk it over and sometimes we can't figure it out but lots of times someone can figure it out especially people like Mark who are very uh, learned in this area and know a lot about optics and everything because they work with that sort of thing every day but mm -hmm. um, you know it's frustrating when people do that and so Sky Kelly is always taking uh, he's an astronaut up on the ISS he's going to be the guy who uh, when he's done will have been in space the longest out of any human um, and he's taken lots of amazing pictures uh, on a regular basis, and one of them he posted, just like several, you know, there's a there's a light, a lit up area in the upper right hand corner, and mm. uh, so of course, you know, these people who do this said, look, he took a picture of a UFO, and look, there's a big alien spacecraft because aliens are watching him, and blah blah blah. But uh, I think in our in our open minds group, one of the admins, Angelo, Mark has put in some interesting comments but uh, was able to show it actually in many of the other pictures you could see in the same frame that Scott T Kelly takes his picture there's part of the ISS that you can see in the top of the frame as Mark pointed out in this particular picture they were on the dark side so there was they were all completely dark so you can't see any th that uh, part of the ISS but you do see a light 
And so he was able to show it looks like that light is uh, from the ISS itself, just a different part of it, not a mm. alien spacecraft. Um, it's actually from the ISS itself? Yeah. Huh. Wow. So, yeah, so, and if you see it, you know, uh, Angelo did a good job where he took other pictures where you can see it, where they're on the light side where they're lit up by the sun, and that is part of the ISS is right there. Wow. So, uh, so, but a lot of media is picking this up because, of course, the UK picks up every one of these stories, some of those uh, uh, tabloid type papers that we talk about often, and uh, now some American media has picked it up, and I know Lee's going to write a story kind of clearing all this up. I'm not even going to, I typically just don't waste my time on those unless, yeah. you know, something interesting comes of them. It's too bad but, something uh, like that, you know, gets carried away right off the bat. And without people yeah. really looking into it, because yeah. uh, you know you're right. Why the only reason to write an article now is to um, set it straight? Because it, um, the UK is writing a lot of articles and kind of uh, um, not really, kind of making a lot of assumptions. I guess I should say it that way. Yeah, and I, you know, we could spend time just uh, setting it straight, but I don't want to be, you know spending all my time uh, uh sp debunking uh you know this crappy stuff that they're they're doing where there's there's really good stuff to pursue right um right now so uh yeah so that's uh so uh, unfortunately there's a lot of bad quality uh kind of stuff getting out there but, uh, you know, if you want to see some of this stuff and debate it or talk about it, uh, the Open Minds UFO group on Facebook is made for discussion. And uh, it's growing pretty quickly, and there's lots of great people in there. Mark is actually one of the admins, so he's in there commenting a lot as well. And so it's a lot of fun. And it's a lot of, you know, there's someone who submitted, there's been a few people who submitted pictures. People have looked at them and then figured out what they are. Uh, there's some where people haven't figured out what they are, but I really encourage people to do that and really thank people, even if we do figure out what it is. It's great to post it in there, and people should not feel badly at all for posting something that turns out to be a reflection or something, because uh, we all do it, and that's what it's, you know, we need to continue to do, is to uh, figure these things out, because uh, there may be a time where you'll post something that is not so easily explained. That's right. Yeah, that's that's good, and and it is growing. I noticed that, and uh, it is a good place for people to um, because there's a lot of really um, talented eyes looking at that stuff. Yeah, some uh, people have been doing that for a while. Mm -hmm. So cool. So uh, your turn. Oh, okay. Um, I want to talk about. I love when there's police officers involved in yeah. UFOs. To me, and I know you know, I've had arguments with uh, skeptics that say, well, they're not any more of, of an observer than anyone else um in my opinion i think they are a little better mm -hmm. um and i also think that they're less inclined to talk about a ufo than the average uh joe would mm -hmm. um because you know it it could be a little bit threatening to their career possibly um but anyway so what happened this is on november 3rd and there were um there were canine officers witnessing um there were green lights sort of like a lime but sort of a bright uh, lime green lights that they saw floating across the sky in ohio and then they noticed that there were two uh equilateral triangles and i think they said there was about they believe there was about seven objects because a lower orb like followed the path of the uh triangles and the other ones and uh a great case. Now these these guys were both. Uh, are, there was more than two, I believe. Um, they were, uh, you know, veterans, and they had um, some pretty extensive law enforcement uh, training and careers. So, anyway, I think it's a good sighting, and it is um, near the Youngstown Warren Regional Airport, and there is a lot going on because of that. But to see solid green uh, lights instead of you know the regular navigation lights on uh, uh, an aircraft. Now, this could be drones, possibly, but um, it, they wouldn't be flying legally, I believe. Uh -huh. So that's what I got. 
Yeah, and I agree with you that, you know, police do have some training, too, in observation. Um, and so that makes them trained, so they are a better um, observer than the average person. Uh, so I mm -hmm. agree with you. I really like them, and like you, like you said, they're putting their they're putting their reputation on the line more so than others. And um, you know, it's almost like any male-dominated fraternity or or uh, like I know I, you when you talk to firemen or other groups, they they get a little bit more um, teasing than others when something happens. And so they have to face right. uh, maybe even a little more ridicule than yeah, the rest back of us. Yeah, the station. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so they they want to be you know really certain when the, they're talking about stuff like this. So I think they are great witnesses. Uh huh. Here's another story that I think is really interesting. Uh, I love these stories. Be I like orb stories. So, of course, there's orb photography uh, that is often, you know, uh, dust particles in the air uh, caught by the flash of a camera mm -hmm. um, or other types of, of things like this. Because even in the IR, in infrared, uh, the infrared uh, that uh, kind of source, infrared light source that isn't visible light, but it is still a type of light, can cause the same effect. Um, but there are people who see uh, credible witnesses, orbs floating around like in forests or the, the brown mountain lights. Uh, I've even seen mm -hmm. a couple of really good orb videos. And unfortunately, these aren't ones that are online. But I've seen some in the, you know, years of investigation, some really good uh, orb videos that have been examined by many people and could not be explained. And we talked about the Hesdalen lights, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, the UFO data group had uh, investigated those. So that's really interesting. Uh, you and I, you know, I talked to with Mark Rodinger also about those. But this is in Oregon where a witness described these lights moving across the property. And the witness, uh, this was in November of 2015. Um, th they saw a large yellow orange fireball with a large tail falling. Uh, it was moving slowly and it lit up this person's property and, uh, they made some pictures of what this thing was like, kind of, uh, cruising across their property below tree level. Mm. So, um, the pictures are really neat. But uh, there are so many witnesses describing this sort of thing that uh, it fascinates me because how amazing would it be to be in the forest and to see this ball of light kind of come floating by? I think some people would be very scared uh -huh. uh, and some would be, I don't know where I'd be. You know, it's kind of funny. Um, you you don't know how you're going to react until something happens. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but this I know my past reaction, you know, to the one sighting that uh -huh. i had was um, definitely one of like what the heck so yeah so that's a really strange one and i love these r orbs uh, marley lights is another place uh i just think this is fascinating probably because i camp and stuff too and so it's one of the things i think about but you know <laughs> now rarely does stuff scare me at least as far as paranormal phenomena it doesn't scare me anymore because you know, when you're out investigating it and you want it to happen so badly, at first you're afraid because you think, uh oh, what if it, you, you're thinking of all the stories, what if it happens, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? But as time goes on and you're trying to experience a phenomena and it doesn't happen and you start to do all of these things to try to make it happen and it doesn't, then, uh, it, you know, you, you lose your fear over time. So even with ghosts and stuff, because I've, I've spent a lot of time even ghost hunting, uh, if I saw something, I would move towards it and I would investigate it. Uh, what scares me are, you know, more of mundane things, or at least uh, animals or humans are more scary than anything. But, uh, but paranormal phenomena, I would move close to... And uh, it may kill me. That may be. I may approach an orb and touch it and uh, disintegrate. And <laughs> you may go it. into another dimension. Yeah. Yeah. Send me a postcard. 
Yeah, I will. If I can, yeah. I'll do yeah. my best. It may be an orb. Yeah, that's okay. Don't touch it. <laughs> just I'll plug into it. I'll just try yeah. to make it scroll. Hello, Martin. <laughs> Zeta Reticuli is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so there's some news for the week. Uh, not other, a lot of other big news, some more sightings uh, from Roger Marsh uh, on the site. And, of course, uh, I've been really working on the, the conference and really excited about that. So I posted the thing about Jacques Vallée and sent an email out. I'm really excited. Uh, I had on Luigi Vindatelli and Emily Trim. Well, Luigi on my show, and there was a special guest in the room, Emily Trim, Emily Trim is actually a witness to the Ruwa encounter, oh, the aerial right. school encounter. For people who don't know, this was a, a thing where all these school children saw a UFO land in the school and an alien come out. And, you know, uh, they're freaking out. And at first, the, the adults were, like, ignoring the kids. And then, you know, uh, they found out, wow, this, you know, these kids really experienced something. And then uh, people went and interviewed them. But we have one of those witnesses, and she's going to talk about her experience incredible experience and the art inspired by the messages she received wow yeah to me that's one of my uh favorite cases it's a lot of people's favorite cases and so that's why i'm so excited uh to have her and in fact i've got to talk to her um but um and she's very timid so that's why she has doesn't really do this uh but her friend luigi is not timid he's a really outgoing uh, guy, he's a UFO researcher and stuff in Canada. Really cool guy, and uh, so he's going to help her along um, to do this, and I think it's going to be fascinating. Well, how's she going to be able to speak? Is she going to have trouble with that? I think she will a bit, uh, but uh, you know they're going to work together. And luckily, they kind of had a trial run. They did this, and uh, uh, we got to meet them in like March. They came to the office. And then partially because my boss got a drone and Luigi sells and, and operates drones. And so mm, he came cool. to help us out and uh, show us how to use it and stuff. And uh, and she came with. And then uh, and she opened up after a little bit, uh, after, you know, getting to know us. Because it's hard to tell people about aliens and stuff, you know. Obviously, she doesn't like to talk to people about it because she doesn't know how they're going to react. Right. Uh, but of course, we were very open to hearing what she had to say, and and it was really cool. But um, Luigi's going to help her, and she did do a talk after that in uh, in Canada, some uh, kind of uh, event they had out there, and so uh, that went well, I guess, and she felt comfortable, and so they're going to do it on stage for us at the Congress. But what's really cool, and I think what will help, is she's going to have a vendor table where she's going to be showing her art. Uh, the entire week oh, at the wow. Congress, and she'll she'll get to interact with people. And I know, knowing our crowd, people are going to be really nice and terribly interested and fascinated by her work. So I'm sure uh, that'll really help her feel more comfortable. Can you see that online anywhere? Does she have a website? No, you can't, actually. She doesn't have a website yet. She does have a Facebook page for Emily Trim. Um, I'm not sure if it's even open to the public. She does post some stuff there. But uh, I know, I think in the picture I posted, there's a little bit of her artwork. And here's what I'll do, um, actually, today. Because I took a picture of her sitting in, right where I am right now uh, with her artwork spread out. And uh, I'll post that picture on her uh, uh, speaker page on uh, the Congress site, because I've been thinking of doing that anyway, so people can see a little bit of her artwork. Great. Yeah, so it's really cool stuff. So, awesome. And then well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, maybe text you a picture or two, Martin, and for the rest of you, you're just going to have to come to the Congress. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Yep. I, that's just the way it goes. Yeah. But we would love to see everybody, so it'll be awesome. So that's what's going on. Um, anything else that you wanted to talk about, buddy? No, I think we did. Uh, we did another uh, kind of a long one today. Yeah, I know, and I, it's a long one with Lee. So people like the longer shows. They're always, you know, begging for long shows. So right, they're yeah. getting one today. Good. All right. I look and, forward to hearing him. 
Yeah, and because of the holiday this week, we won't have a UFO report uh, on YouTube this week. So uh, people will be able to enjoy a long uh, UFO or a long uh, uh, Open Minds radio. And you know what's great, people? And this is what I think people should do. I think this is what Martin's going to do is share this podcast with your family. You know, when you all gather at Thanksgiving and sit down for dinner, you know, yeah. pop in the podcast and play it. Um, it's while like you're one having of those old, old tube radios. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So while you're having Thanksgiving dinner, you know, uh, treat your family to some UFO news and information. We'd love yeah. to be there at the table with you for Thanksgiving, right, Martin? That's right. Cozy up with us. Yeah. Hi, Grandma. <laughs> Don't eat that too much pumpkin pie, Grandma. Yeah, save me some stuffing. Yeah, all yeah. right. Okay, cool. Well, you have a great holiday yourself, Marty. Same here. All right, Alejandro. All okay. right, thank you. You said that very well. All right. All right, Take well, care. let's hear what uh, that goofy Lee Spiegel guy has to say. I am so happy to be back here with Lee Spiegel. Welcome back to the show, Lee well, thank you, Alejandro. It, it seems like forever since we did this. Yeah, doesn't <laughs> it? You know what's funny? I have your page up with your stories. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we can talk about some of them in a minute. But, of course, we have a little bit more exciting stuff to talk about first. Not that all your stories aren't exciting. <laughs> but it's funny to see these. Um, I mean, it looks like there are versions of your stories in Korean. And uh, this looks like. I don't know what language. This is French, maybe? Yeah, it, it, I, I don't know who decided to do that. And it's, it's not just for my stories. I think it's partially a way of letting people who go to you know, each writer has their own a story section. Maybe it's a way of showing people that we are international. Mm -hmm. And so now, now we're going to prove it. <laughs> You know, by letting you see an entire story in, you know, in Indian or, you know, Indo-Chinese or Korean. And I, I mean, that's fine. It, it's kind of a hoot for me to see what it actually looks like in another language. I, I kind of like that. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, because I'm looking, I decided to look at my page and they haven't translated mine into any other language. Well, your stuff <laughs> really belongs in English, I think. Yeah, it's it's. But that is really awesome, I think. I, I you know, because it's one thing that I really appreciate, and it kind of is a good segue into one of the our big topics for today. But uh, is the international audience? So, for instance, this show and our website has quite a large international audience. We have a lot of Australians um, and British people um, listening to us. Maybe some French people, who, of course. We hope are, are safe and uh, are, are doing okay over there, but uh, as well as all the people in all of the unfortunately areas where there's problems going on. Beirut, where was the other? Oh, the the Boko Haram. Oh my gosh, in Africa. Hopefully those people. We have some African news actually to talk about too. But it's really cool yeah. to have this international audience. And in fact, this is what's funny because this is what we're going to talk about is Jacques Vallée. Yes who's French, and uh, when I posted earlier this week and uh, that Jacques Vallée, or earlier today, uh, or earlier in the week, I should say, yeah. that Jacques Vallée was going to be speaking at the UFO Congress, the first people, oh no, this is what I did, I'm sorry. Oh, and you played along with this. I posted <laughs> just to, to tease people and to kind of... Um, Get them ready to chum the waters, I suppose. <laughs> I posted in our Open Minds UFO News Group, which if you haven't joined on Facebook, you should, uh, listeners out there. Uh, I posted, hey, I'm just curious to hear what you guys think about Jacques Vallée. And the first people to respond were some French people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I wonder if the French are more aware of Jacques. And um, I guess... You know, we'll start off with, because there is some French news uh, relating to Jacques uh, that happened recently, and I know you're well aware of this, but um, we'll start off with, you're the reason we got Jacques Vallée to come to the Congress. Thank you so much, and how did that happen? Well, you know, you and I were talking a while ago about what what could I do if you were going to invite me back to the Congress, what could I do that would be different from just me standing on stage and doing a lecture or a presentation, something that could involve a newsmaker of some sort who doesn't 
normally go to UFO events for a variety of reasons. And, and, and who has been portrayed, uh, who was portrayed uh, in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He was portrayed by the very famous director and actor Francois Truffaut. And, and I think that people... Whenever I talk to people about that movie, when I say, did you ever see Close Encounters? And when I say, do you remember a character of a French scientist who was like the focus of the military and the government research into extraterrestrials? People say, oh, yeah, yeah, really liked that character. And I say, well, you know, the character named Claude Lacombe was actually modeled after Jacques Vallée. And, and when I first met Jacques, which was just a few months after Close Encounters came out. Close Encounters was the big holiday movie for 1977. And I started working and putting my United Nations presentation together in early 78. And so I met Jacques for the first time while Close Encounters was still kind of lingering in the movie theaters and lingering in the consciousness of the public. And so for me... It was it was a huge thrill to finally meet him. And and as people will discover when they go to the Congress, if they have a chance to actually talk with him, it's it's like talking to the character in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he sounds like that character. He says the same kinds of things like that character. He's very soft spoken. And when he talks, you have to pay attention to him, you know, because he has so many really interesting, fascinating things to talk about in the whole UFO community that people just don't get involved with or hear about. And he's always been consistent in that vein. He he may have changed his mind through the years of what he thinks might be going on with UFOs or the intelligence behind UFOs, but his his approach and how he presents it it's it's amazing. People just really will stop and listen to what he has to say. I've seen him. I've seen videos of Jacques on stage at like TED conferences where he's not talking about UFOs at all, but he's talking about other abstract things in science that he's involved with. And you just can't help but listen to what mm-hmm. he's saying. That And th- th- that takes a lot of charisma uh, to, to have that effect on people. So when you and I w- were talking about what I could possibly do, and I started coming up with a, a, like a wish list of who I might want to be on a stage with at the Congress, uh, talking one-on-one, uh, Jacques was like right, right at the top of the list um, because he and I had not really been together since he was one of my main speakers at the uh, the UN presentation that I did, uh, it'll be 38 years ago uh, in 2016. So I I spoke with him several weeks ago because he contacted me. He he's his book Wonders in the Sky um, that he that, that he's a co-author of uh, with Chris Arbach from um, from France. Um, it's it's an amazing book, and I know that you feel the same way about this, where it takes the whole idea of UFOs, where people think modern UFO era means the 1940s is where it all started. But that's blatantly untrue. <laughs> it's completely untrue. And and it, it hit their book t- starts just before the Industrial Revolution and goes backward in time. And that's amazing because they've come up with incredible scientific uh, and non-scientific studies and sightings and reports going back thousands of years into antiquity that all resemble things that people are reporting now, which means it's never changed the kinds of things that people have reported. uh, And we can get more, more into that later, but, but, just knowing that the, the new book was coming out again, he's he's updating the book, and he asked me if I if I might consider writing an update story uh, to help promote his book. And I said yes, Jacques. I, I think that's that's excellent. I love your book. And so while I had him, while I had his attention, I said, so Jacques, let me ask you something. W- would you have any interest in appearing with me on a stage 
in February at the International UFO Congress, and and I I got quiet because I was expecting him to say no no I don't do things like that, but he said yes, <laughs> and I almost fell out of my chair. Um, he he said yes I was right that he doesn't do UFO conferences, um, and he wanted to do this. He thought that the idea was intriguing to not have to do a presentation, but to sit there in a couple of nice chairs and just have a, a discussion for an hour or so and just talk about things that people really want to hear about, about UFOs and what, what, what might really be going on. And he said he would love to do that with me. And so I think I immediately contacted you and said, what do you think about Jacques Vallée? And then after you got off the floor, because when you fell out of your chair, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we, we we've been piecing it together now and 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 today you made the announcement well and i don't think that you even knew i don't remember if you knew if uh, i don't think you did that you know we've been trying to get him for years so luckily no, I, I didn't know you yeah. you told me that and i was really amazed to hear that because the only interview I've gotten with him after trying for years, even when I was with Move On way back when we had tried to get him, because at least for me and a lot of ufologists, I mean, <clears throat> Jacques Vallée is a ufologist, ufologist, you know, yeah. um, the first thing that comes to mind with uh, living icons in this field, uh, one of the first is Jacques Vallée. And so, but I've never been able to get him. So when, you know, you... Uh, at first, my first thought when you mentioned his name is that, yeah, right, it's not going to happen. Um, but I think that was – you hadn't even told me you were going to try, and then you were like, what do you think of this? And it's like, are you kidding? That would be amazing. So, <laughs> yeah, it's so exciting because we've tried for so long, and uh, he's such a neat guy. Um, and Wonders in the Sky is so great. I mean – Oh, was, Yeah. It's a great book, and, and I was so excited when it came out because he hadn't done anything for a long time in this field. And this is my question to you, too. As far as you know, having known him for so long, has mm -hmm. he ever spoken at a UFO conference? I don't know. You, you know, he, he will do events like a TED event, or he'll go someplace um, where it'll be – he'll be invited as one of many scientists. Uh, he, he likes – being with scientists, he likes talking with them um, because he he doesn't he doesn't like to be around uh, situations where there could be a fringe element. And there's always that possibility at at so many conferences, um, and and he likes to shy away from that. And 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 he knows that there are people out there who don't necessarily agree with his vision of UFOs or uh, where they might come from and what they might mean to earthlings. And he, he sometimes is concerned about um, how people might react to him. So he does shy away from stuff that's truly not scientific. I, I think if, if, he th if he knows that there's going to be a science aspect to it, he's very interested in it. I mean, I know last year, uh, Jacques and uh, Dr. Richard Haynes, a uh, former NASA scientist, they were the only two American scientists who were invited to a big conference, a science conference in uh, in Paris. Uh, and they were they were surprised that a lot of mainstream media just ignored it completely. And and this is this is the kind of thing that bothers Jacques. Uh, a lot because he doesn't understand how science can ignore this. Well, and but this was what I was wondering about that because, of course, I would have written about the French thing, and there were a lot of us, you know, um, now we're online, you know, communicating and everything, trying to get information about that meeting, but they were very tight lipped. They I know. weren't releasing any videos or any information, uh, so none of us could get anything. Uh, I think they finally did go to you. I think they, they gave you some stuff. But, I mean, did they go to the press to try to get them to cover it? No, and that, that's that's part of the point. I don't believe that the media was even invited to it. Mm. So so it's like, gee, you, 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 can't, you can't have it both ways. If you're a scientist, if you want the media to cover what you do uh, in an unbiased way, then then invite them. 
let them come to, to these things and to talk about um, what it's all about. Uh, earlier this year, there was, a, there was a big, I think it was a one day, was it a one day uh, or maybe a two day event <coughs> um, in, uh, in Washington? And I believe it was at the National Archives. Um, and it was a whole thing about bringing scientists and researchers together to talk about how close are we as a species to having first contact with another intelligence. And I think Seth Shostak of the SETI Institute, I think he was the first speaker to get up and talk about it. And, and as you and I know, a lot of scientists, very conservative scientists who would prefer not to even mention the word UFOs. Um, part of this, a very big part of this from people I've talked with is they won't they won't do that. They won't acknowledge even the slightest possibility that there, there are some UFO aspects that should be scientifically investigated. <clears throat> and the reason why they won't talk about it, the reason why airline pilots won't talk about the objects that often come buzzing around their aircraft that they can't explain is because they all know that if they start to talk, it can be a career killer. We've heard this over and over again, um, you know, and, and, it's, and it's been like that for a long time. Um, and, and, and there have been pilots who were basically said, if you go to the press and talk about this, it would be very bad for our company and therefore very bad for your future here. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you deal with that? If, if you've had an experience, if you've seen something you can't explain and you want to talk about it, but you realize you can't, um, you know, it's it's a tough decision. Years ago, the the military um, put out a, um, um, a a dictate. I think it was called Janet Janet J A N A P Joint Army Navy Air Publication, and this this was an official rule and regulation. It was a law that said anybody in the military who talks about or releases any classified info about UFOs. Uh, I, I forget what the fine was, but it was like five years in prison and a $10,000 fine. It's like, whoa, well, who's going to talk under those circumstances? You had, so you pretty much answered the question. You didn't think he's, you're not sure if he spoke with other UFO things, but he did do this scientific thing. I'm, I'm going to guess, and we, we could certainly ask Jacques in private, yeah. that if, if, if he has talked at UFO conferences, it's... It's been in the distant past, I would suspect. Yeah, for sure. Because, I mean, yeah. uh, you and I keep up on what he does. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned the TED Talk. The other exciting thing that he did not too long ago, and I think this is really cool, and this is a difference. And, you know, this is what it made me think of. This is what I was going to ask you is that um, when you referred how, you know, talking about UFOs could be a career killer, mm -hmm. um, Jacques Vallée was essentially, when he went to Northwestern, he was uh, kind of a protege of J. Allen Hynek, who was an right. astronomer there who uh, consulted for the Air Force. So, hi, uh, so Jacques has always been attached to the UFO thing, but he's a very successful person. Mm -hmm. So luckily it hasn't hampered him, it doesn't seem. Maybe that's something you could ask him. But uh, one of the other appearances he did, which is, I think, extraordinary, is this huge, very expensive and elaborate business meeting in Saudi Arabia oh, yes. years ago where he convinced them to do a track of lectures about UFOs and aliens, uh, which had like what, Nick Pope, Stan Friedman, and then I think Dr. Michio Kaku. Michio Kaku, and the, the only other person there was, I think, someone who was... Uh, associated with the, uh, the the Saudi Arabia um, organization, and each of those people uh, had something like eight minutes or ten minutes, um, and they actually they they released each of the of the little speeches by these people in high resolution, and you can go on on YouTube and you can see them all, and and it was done very well. And you're right, uh, Jacques was there. And uh, I think at one point he, he said in his in his talk that um, there was something about what Michio Kaku had said that really uh, impressed Jacques and influenced him. It's, it's always good, I think, when you get important people like that who um, who praise each other and and and, you know, who recognize and acknowledge 
that there are other people like you, other scientists in, in this case, who do think that it's important to keep an open mind. Um, so I and I mean I mean ab absolutely and and you know I I didn't tell you this before, but um, once you actually announced that Jacques Vallée was going to be at the UFO Congress, I got an email from someone uh, in Sydney, Australia. You mentioned Australia before. Mm -hmm. Sydney, Australia. This person is very well known hmm. in the in the UFO community worldwide, and in fact, he has a lot of people who really don't like his opinions on UFOs. <laughs> and and he's been on stage before and been in 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 all kinds of controversial situations. And uh, John Alexander and his wife landed in Sydney, Australia today, and. And he emailed me right after he saw your announcement. And the first thing he said to me was, that's going to be a big draw. So there you go. Somebody, this Australian person said that. No, no. John Alexander went to Australia. Oh, right? oh John Alexander. Yeah, yeah, he's always on our site commenting and everything. Yeah, John Alexander is great. He's our... He's our our friend and uh yeah although he is controversial but th see that's that's what's really interesting because he has a sim similar issue as nick pope or um uh jacques valet some yeah. people get frustrated with jacques because he says and when i interviewed him he he really pushed this uh, this idea of that you know we don't know that these things are alien and he kept that's saying right. that over and over again that's and right. uh, which i think is a valid and an excellent point um, but I did finally pin him down at the end, and I and he was he was reticent, and I kind of had to pull it out of him. But do you believe that some of this phenomena may be extraterrestrial in nature? And he went so far as to say, I believe most likely yes that some of this is probably, if not definitely, extraterrestrial in nature. So that was a pretty bold statement. Yeah. But you know, so there you go. It's not that he he doesn't believe that, or he's saying it's not true, or debunking, or something like that. He's just looking for further answers and making sure we're careful and not jumping to assumptions. John Alexander, he says UFOs are real. People don't listen. He believes right. in a lot of great cases just because he doesn't think there's as big of a grand conspiracy as everyone else. And he's more qualified to know, quite frankly. Yes. Uh, doesn't mean he's, he's you know, debunking. Same with Nick Pope, who has kind of a similar, not exactly – but similar perspective as John Alexander. And this is the one that frustrates me the most. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting on my soapbox now. Ooh, but uh, I think you would, would sympathize, is that Nick Pope has done more for this field than many, many other people. I mean, he, he worked for the defense, uh, Ministry of Defense. He doesn't have to talk about this topic. He could totally shy away from it. It probably would help his career. But he never backs down that this is a phenomena. It's real. He he learned that from researching it at, in defense, kind of like J. Allen Hynek's perspective uh, had changed once he did some invest, official investigation. And right. he has enlightened these higher echelons of media that he is able to access – kind of like Leslie Kane or even you, yeah. um, he's enlightened so many people and shocked so many people. and, um, and But people are still, oh, he worked for the government. He's not sharing everything. He's a bad guy. It's a kind of a frustrating thing that uh, all of these people, and, well, and even you face at times because, of course, you're working for mainstream media, which, of course, the Illuminati and the aliens are all controlling. And <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, you found out. <laughs> <laughs> well... You know, I I love Nick Pope on so many different levels because, and I may have told you this, and I I love Nick Pope's theories, his his beliefs, um, and as you said, he worked at the Ministry of Defense office for a few years, um, it, like the UFO desk was his desk, and a couple of years ago I, I interviewed him. I, I've interviewed him many times, and. And I, I said, so so t tell me about what the overall attitude was, Nick, in the Ministry of Defense when you were there, um, because you've, you've mentioned before that you basically were told to do whatever you could to, to ridicule or debunk 
UFO reports. And he and then he suddenly said, yeah, that was called spin and dirty tricks. And I said, what? What, what are you talking about? What, what does spin and dirty tricks mean? He said, well, we were told from high up that as UFO reports came in, we were to do our very best to basically to debunk them and make them go away. And I said, but that, that's what the Air Force in our country had Alan Hynek do for 20 years when he was working with Project Blue Book. He was, he was the token scientist who the Air Force would send around to places and to make the UFO stories go away. So you're saying you did the same thing in England and they were called spin and dirty tricks? He said, yeah. I said, well, didn't that bother you, Nick? What, what, what kind of a conscience did you have to actually ridicule people? He said, look, the attitude was we couldn't tell the citizens of our country that there was something operating in our skies that we couldn't identify, we couldn't catch, and we tried, and we, we couldn't force them down. We had no control over them. We couldn't tell the population that we didn't know how to deal with this. And so the better route was to just make the stories go away. I'm like, wow, okay. I, I guess I understand that, even though I don't agree with it. But the fact that you're telling us this now is very important, I think. That there is this attitude among many countries that something is going on in the skies around our planet. And we all know this. All of, all of us who've done serious research into UFOs over the years, it's pretty obvious from early documents, early military documents, that the Air Force the air forces of this country and other countries have been baffled by these things that are flying around coming and going as they wish that's that's not a good thing to tell your population so where i'm heading with that is is that i think that people in a position of of being able to impart really good Information like Nick Pope, like Jacques Vallée, like Ch Colonel Chuck Halt. He's another one who, who only in the last year or two started coming out publicly and saying, Barry, if you folks in the public think that there's no longer any real interest in UFOs, you've got another thought coming because there is at least one major agency in the United States that all the other agencies have to report to. And they are seriously looking into UFO reports. Well, you know, it's like, wow, this is a retired Air Force colonel who who has been involved with some pretty heavy-duty UFO encounters, the, the Rendlesham Forest one being the biggie in the 1980s uh, in England. And and he he's that kind of guy who now says many military people won't talk about this because it would be a career killer. He loves to use that phrase, and I think he's right. I, there, there is this attitude, and and I'm going to talk to Jacques about this on stage. I, I'm going to have him specifically address this as to why airline pilots, why military personnel, why scientists are still reluctant to talk about this. I, I want to yeah. really get to talk about this. Well, you know, one of the cases where you and I dealt with this um, – and and this is kind of an interesting question to me to kind of put you on the spot actually a okay. bit. All right. Is that uh, you know that's one of the people we're going to have, and I think it is you know in the earlier in the day than when you and Jacques are speaking at the Congress, but uh, yeah. is Robert Powell and this Puerto Rico case. And in this Puerto Rico case, there was an expert. You and I were uh, given the information and in who this expert was, what his expertise was. Uh, so at least I, and I'm not sure what you had went through, but I was able to verify this guy was who he was. But he nor his colleagues wanted to go on the record. Um, and uh, I don't think, and I, I don't know uh, if you're still planning on it. I wrote a story on what he had told us. But um, I, what I think is interesting is that case, I would like to hear your thoughts. You never wrote a story on that case, and I'm curious as to why and what you thought of of this guy did you doubt him or or what do you think 
No, I, I didn't necessarily doubt him. And I guess for the listeners, we should guess, just give a, a brief background. We're talking about uh, uh, like uh, an alleged, I guess you can use the word alleged, Homeland Security video that depicted um, an unexplained or unknown object that was flying at very low altitude. Um, I, f- I forget how many miles it went, but this was just uh, this was just a couple of years ago, and uh, and and the idea was that camera or cameras on board a Homeland Security vessel was able to track this UFO for a long distance, and and the, the word was that. It, it was going so fast, and then I guess it went into some water and then came out of water. And um, I believe Mark D'Antonio, a mutual friend of ours that we both respect, and he's the, the photo and video uh, analyst chief for MUFON, uh, I believe that initially I think Mark had indicated it might have it might have been some kind of a blimp. Do you recall that was as part of his? Well, here's the problem with that, though. And this is what it, this it, Mark felt that it was possibly a balloon. Balloon, right? Yeah. Uh, but Mark is not a an expert uh, in these systems like this expert we talked to was. Mm. And this guy, uh, you know, was able to detail point by point why he felt this was not a balloon. There's no way it was balloon and not a bird, and and it made a lot of sense. And it was one simple concept was it wouldn't be at the color it was. It wouldn't look like a, an extremely hot object like this one did. Uh, a balloon wouldn't do that. Um, not only that, and then, you know, I've talked with Mark about this, and Mark hasn't had the time to do a full analysis to yeah. argue his point. And so that's why it's great Mark has an opinion, but until he can finish his analysis uh, – and counter the the true expert. Um, well, and I I will tell just you another opinion out there. Well, to to answer your first question, and and I, I absolutely believe this because I was working on a couple of other stories when when you broke your story. My opinion was I could not have done a better job on reporting the story than you did. I really liked what you did, and I always like what you do because you 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 dig and you get under people's skin to to really get information and you keep digging until you're satisfied with what you got and and you did it on this case and and I liked it so much that I I remember talking to a couple of people here in New York and I said you know I don't think I can I can do any better than what what Alejandro did because this is a great story. Oh, oh shucks. Well, no, but I mean, well, thank I, you very much. No, I two thoughts on that. First of all, you're making me blush. Thank you <laughs> so much for saying that because I I feel the same way about your work, and oh. that's why. But you're at a completely different level. Best case scenario, let's say best best case. Hmm? I'm gonna get maybe I could maybe get two hundred thousand, four hundred thousand hits on on a that would be gangbusters. Uh, to look at my story, you get millions of people to look at your stories. That's why you're at a different level. That's why it, you it, you doing your version of it is is taking to another level. That's one thing. But um, the second thing that which is getting towards my question though, okay, uh, is that um, so it wasn't that you didn't think that this guy was credible, and and I guess what were your thoughts? I mean, I found it really interesting. That uh, these guys were so guarded with their, um, with their, who they were and who they worked for. I was surprised at first that that if indeed it was a Homeland Security camera that that caught this thing, this object, I was surprised that it was released instead of being you know hidden away like so many official mm-hmm. um, pieces of evidence have been in the past. Um, I actually liked the video a lot. I I remember the first couple of times I looked at it, it's one of those things where it the thing is moving so fast, so consistently, and the camera had it tracked all the way, I couldn't take my eyes off the screen. <laughs> you know, it, was, it, it wasn't like it just appeared for three or four seconds, like a lot of UFO videos that we see, and then they go away or they blink out. This thing was like trucking along. And I thought, wow, this this... 
not only is it moving really fast, but I was I was very impressed with how accurately and clearly the camera captured it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and yeah. I felt the same. This was one of those because it's a lot. I'll examine it very closely to try to figure out what it is. Yeah, and then I'll be like, oh, I can't figure this out. So I'll do like you do. I'll send it to people. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, you know, a buddy had gotten a hold of me and said, hey. We're looking at this. Uh, we've got a great group of people, other people I knew. And uh, so I was like, OK, great, because these guys are going to figure it out. And um, and if they can't, then that's a big deal. And of course, they couldn't figure it out. And so far, it's upheld. And uh, Richard Haynes, you know, um, likes mm-hmm. their work. And he also can't figure out what it is. And he, of course, uh, uh, works for a group called NICAP and uh, is a scientist who's worked for NASA. And uh, he handles... Um, pilot UFO cases. It's so amazing. You know, you, you'll you'll get people like Richard Haynes, um, even even Bruce Maccabee to a degree. I I have many times tried to pin Dr. Bruce Maccabee. Um, for for your listeners who who aren't aware of him, he is a, a a retired Navy optical physicist, and he's worked on a variety. Of, of government programs, classified programs, and he's also analyzed a lot of UFO images and videos. And yet, in, in, the, in the countless times that I've interviewed Bruce, every time, every time I'll ask him, I'll say something like, "So, Bruce, at one point, at some point in the conversation, I'll I'll say to him, Bruce, do you believe that some of these UFOs come from other planets?" And he's he's quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> he he won't come out and say, Yes, I think some of them may be. And and sometimes that infuriates me. That's funny. You know, because it's it's like he's always kind of on the edge of saying, Well, we don't know what this technology is and how these things can do this and they make all these, you know, sudden turns and ninety ninety degree angle turns and yet He's the perfect example of a of a serious, legitimate, credible scientist who mm-hmm. won't who won't take that final step and say, "Yes, I think I think that they could be uh, from outer space." And he's retired, so he has nothing to lose at this point. Well, uh, he just wants to be careful. Maybe he doesn't know. I mean, my it's funny. My girlfriend, who you know, Karen, and I yeah. get in arguments all the time. Even when we were in New York. You know, your hometown, and uh, yeah. we visited the Smithsonian. I Well, we saw you there. We visited you there at the mm-hmm. museum, and we went down to the Egyptian part. Yeah. We're arguing because she's, like, looking. She's into the ancient alien stuff, and she's like, look at this. This has to represent aliens or UFOs. And I'm <laughs> like, no, it doesn't. And she says, well, what is it? And I tell her, I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, then it's got to be that. No, it doesn't. Just because we don't know what it is. You know, unless we definitely know, then we can't say it could be, you know, some guy tripping on something. Dude. So it's kind of funny because we have the same thing and she gets infuriated like you do with Bruce. Well, yeah, and, and it's it's like and this is again, this is why I love so much uh, Jacques Vallée's book where uh, he, he brings forth the descriptions of things that people have reported through the centuries and they they always report something in the terms that they understand of their of their time. So so in the 1400s, <clears throat> they weren't using the term UFO because nobody had come up with that term yet. But they they'd see something like great aerial ships, okay, great circular flying shields, oh, um, very bright circular orbs. Uh, doing battle with each other in the sky. Now that all does sound very much like modern UFO reports, mm-hmm. uh, but it, it but they could only describe them in the phrases and in the terms that they knew back then, mm-hmm. in or, in order to to write about them, to report about them. And this is what is 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 so important to me these days i've i've been looking into this for 40 years and i've 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 modified my opinions about ufo's and flying saucers and where they might or might not come from and the the one thing that i've i've really noticed is that people are consistent j allen hynek <clears throat> once said to me you know they're not 
reporting flying pink elephants because if they were then that would be strange and we, we'd have to like really rethink everything but that's not what people are reporting the shapes and the sightings are remarkably consistent mm -hmm. and, they, and they always have been <clears throat> yeah that's what's well you know, yeah the book has spheres and orbs and triangles oh, oh yeah and and you know you when you talk to like a like debunkers or uh, re religious debunkers who look at some of the ancient tapestries and paintings, uh, Madonna and Child and the Christ and blah blah blah, and you see these these amazing paintings that are real paintings hanging in real places that depict um, flying saucers in the sky, shooting beams of light down on the ground and and doing amazing things, and religious debunkers or even even non-religious debunkers will automatically say well <clears throat> it's just religion or religious symbolism and i hate that and i hate well, that well you're in a unique experience to be frustrated about that or in a unique place because you've had a similar experience yes and i don't know if we have talked about it on the show before so but I w I, that's one of the things I really wanted you to do is to describe your sighting because you just kind of described it. And it does fit not only, you know, uh, religious experiences, but some of the paintings yes. that you see out there. I, I know. Um, in 1975, I was putting together a documentary vinyl record for CBS called UFOs, The Credibility Factor. <clears throat> and I, I was gathering the voices of law enforcement, politicians, military personnel, scientists, private citizens, bringing all the voices together to not only describe their own encounters, but to speak together to try and get the governments to to acknowledge that there is something going on about UFOs. So I'm working on gathering all the information in 1975, and Dr. Hynek calls me. Uh, and he, he tells me that he's been getting phone calls from law enforcement officials in Lumberton, North Carolina, that for the last two or three nights in a row, people have been reporting some strange object on there that they can't explain. And they called him for help. and. He called me and he said, he said, I don't have any investigators down there. Um, could you take some time off and go down and see what it is that they're what they're reporting? And if you get enough good, credible interviews and sketches and drawings or whatever, I'll publish your findings through the Center for UFO Studies. And I asked him, I said, what, what, what are they reporting? What are they seeing? And, and to my disappointment, he said, well, they're, they're, they're seeing something that we haven't heard very much about yet in 1975. They're, they're seeing a, a, a flying triangle object or a boomerang-shaped object. And I went, really? Mm -hmm. I, I, I said, you're, you're not sending me to North Carolina to maybe see a classic flying saucer? Because that's what I'd really like to see, Alan. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he said, listen, if... If you don't want to go, and I said, don't complete that sentence, I'm going because you're the last person I want to piss off, <laughs> literally. And I said, I'm, I'm gone. I'll be there. And within a few hours of my arrival in the sheriff's department in Lumberton, North Carolina, in April of 1975, the call started coming into the dispatcher and into a into a car we went and for, staying in touch with other cars from other counties with car radios and until we all converged in front of this field. Um, the, the sun had already gone down, the stars were coming out, very dark. The only sound that we could all hear in the area were nervous animals, nervous about something going on. What and, does nervous animals sound like? You, you know, like you, you can tell like if, like if a horse uh, imagine Mr. Oh, Ed, yeah. you know, the kind of sound that they make if they're nervous or even a dog, dogs that just won't stop barking, mm -hmm. you know, things like that, you know, making sounds for no apparent reason. Like, okay. Okay. And um, we were in front of this field and on the other side of the field uh, was a line of trees and above the tops of the trees 
there was a, an alternating white and red light. Just it would be white, then red, then white and red, and it was moving slowly across the tops of the trees, and then it, it stopped when it got to the point where on the other side of the field it was kind of directly opposite where we were standing on our side of the field, and it started moving across the field toward us. And it got closer and closer and closer until it stopped directly above us in the sky. And at that point, with it being so close, we couldn't hear any engine. It had no engine sound, and it just stopped and was floating there in the sky. And at that point, because it was so close, and because it had white lights up one side and red lights up the other side and a bigger white light at the apex of it, because of the lights, we could see the illuminated shape of the triangle. That's how we knew that it was a triangle shaped. And and we're just standing there looking <laughs> looking up at this thing going, wow, are you kidding? And And I remember thinking combination of, well, I, I feel pretty safe because I'm surrounded by these men with their six shooters. <laughs> and, and then I immediately thought, no, wait a minute, what am I saying to myself? If this thing is here to eat us, <laughs> no, no, no little six shooter is going to save us <laughs> at all. And, and as all these kinds of thoughts were going through my head, the big bright light at the apex of it suddenly shot a beam down. Beam came right out of it and, and, and hit the ground right where we were standing. And and that was like, oh, okay, that was not expected. Now, that lasted maybe, maybe three seconds at the most, which, you know, in that kind of a situation might seem like forever. Mm-hmm. But the beam went back up into the, into the ship, the craft, whatever. And the whole thing, all the lights on it turned off. And then it became an amber color. And as the amber color of it started shining, the whole thing started moving in about a 45 degree angle. It just turned in the sky and it slowly started to go away as if it was saying to us, I'm done with you guys. I'm going to somewhere else to mess around with somebody else. <laughs> and we, you know, we got, we got into the cars and, and kept in touch with other law enforcement people in in the in the neighboring counties so that we knew which other people were seeing the same thing and for me this was good because i could go and get interviews and and we stopped at different places and we came upon this this uh, police chief police chief gary moore i remember his name was and you could tell he was like a no-nonsense kind of southern sheriff, like, don't screw with me, you, you know, I'll, I'll have you for breakfast <laughs> kind of attitude. And he was still sitting in his car when we got there, and and he knew we were coming, so he didn't mind answering some questions. And he said he, said he was just sitting in his car, and all of a sudden, the, the inside of his car just completely lit up. And he looked out the window, um, just like... Richard Dreyfus did in Close Encounters of the Third Kind when he's on the railroad tracks and the UFO is above him <laughs> and he just kind of leans over to look up and the, the police chief said, this thing was just sitting in the sky. It was parked in the sky above me. And I said, well, what did you do? He said, well, I got out of the car, went to the trunk, pulled out my big official police lantern. I aimed it up at the thing and I blinked it and it blinked back at me. I went, whoa. That's interesting. Then what did you do? He said, well, I aimed it again and I blinked twice and it blinked twice back at me and then it left. <laughs> like, okay, I'm good with that one. Thank you. Thank you for the interview. We found two other police officers who were on patrol together outside a small town and they said that they had heard through their car radios that this thing was coming in the sky in their direction and they get out of the car and they saw it coming toward them and they said that without it missing a beat instead of just going over their heads it it made a quick 90 degree angle turn and went off in another direction without stopping Mm -hmm. yeah you know when when you come upon stuff like that and you know it's not a hoax you, you know it's not being perpetrated by someone you know you've seen something and been part of an experience that that from that point on, 
many other people would have. You and I know a man named David Marlar, mm -hmm. uh, who wrote a really interesting book a couple of years ago about triangular UFOs in America. And, and this UFO from North Carolina uh, was one of the things he investigated. He got a hold of the report that Dr. Heineck had published. And, and, and I didn't know this at the time, but David told me that his research revealed that the encounter that I was involved with in 1975 was the very first well-documented, multiple witness encounter of a triangular shaped UFO. This was years before hmm. the Phoenix Lights. Mm -hmm. And but so I, did, I didn't know that. That was amazing to find out. Well, what's interesting too is, and what made me think of it uh, also was I hadn't thought of it in the sense of Jacques Vallée's book of these, these sightings in, in, mm. in antiquity and yeah. these old paintings of, you know, these beams of light coming down on people. I know. I know. It, it, it's amazing. And, and it, it's like, you know, how many of these do you have to get hit over the head by? How many of these paintings before you realize maybe it's not just religious symbolism is what I saw in 1975 a product of my non-religious symbolic mind playing tricks on me? No, it was something that was actually there in the sky and I was with other people. So you, you, you have to get to a point where you have to make rational decisions about what what you're seeing or what other people have reported seeing. Um you know, again, it's this whole spin and dirty tricks thing that, that Nick Pope was trying to tell me about. Um, you know, if, if he'd had the chance or someone else in the United States had the chance, they probably would have turned my encounter into a spin and dirty trick and tried to ridicule me and the other people about what we saw. But it never got to that point, And I was mm -hmm. very happy about that. Yep. Thank goodness. Well, awesome. I mean, that's an incredible sighting. But um, uh, to change the subject, yeah, because uh, we're running out of time, uh, I wanted to ask you about one more thing. Luckily, this all pertains to the conference and everything. And, and yes. uh, uh, but uh, the Ruwa incident, the aerial encounter, um, maybe if you can kind of explain it, uh, what you know about it and uh, your thoughts. I, I didn't do as much investigation as as other people i i know that uh J james fox was a little bit more involved with that you might actually be um better equipped to tell the listeners what this was all about this was the, like a, an alien encounter that um let's see it, it took place in it was in zimbabwe right if i if i recall it's like coming back to me now there, there was it was it took place at a school and I f it was like 94, like maybe 20 years ago, I guess, that students at the school reported seeing something come out of the sky and land near the school. And they, they reported occupants that were associated with this craft. They saw somebody come out of the craft. And, and in fact, these beings exchanged or had some kind of um, interaction with the kids. And I, th I forgot who first made it, uh, uh, who first covered well, it. I think the, the BBC the, covered the BBC, it, and, uh, yeah. but John Mack in a documentary, because John Mack went out and interviewed yes. the kids. Yeah, the Harvard, Harvard psychiatrist, John Mack, um, who, who spent a, a long time um, investigating uh, occupant stories, you know, close encounters of the third and fourth kind, um, and you know the, where people had had claimed to have been like abducted, but, but I don't believe that any of the kids were abducted in in this case. And years later, uh, I know that James Fox was there and had interviewed some of, some of the people, some of the kids who are now grown up, and when they when they tell their story. You can still feel the emotion um, of what they went through and what they never forgot. It's like you 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 believe that so they saw something, experienced something extraordinary. And and uh, the young lady Emily that you're going to have at the Congress, um, she, th does she speak uh, good English uh, now, or, or was that was that never a problem? Oh yeah, never a problem. They speak okay. English. They're just uh, you know with a, a kind of a British accent type of thing. But she doesn't. She's Canadian now. Um, in fact, ah. I think maybe she has a Canadian accent. But 
Yeah, that's why I was asking because, um, like you described, uh, it's a it's a great case, and yeah, that's another exciting uh, speaker we're going to have. And uh, yeah, I, I think that there hasn't been one of these witnesses. These projects you're talking about, uh, mm-hmm. where the kids have been interviewed, yes, a couple of them. Randall Nickerson is doing one. Uh, he's been working on it for years, and we had him at our conference a few years ago. James Fox is working on a right. documentary called 701, and he's going to include that case in there. But uh, these documentaries haven't come to uh, fruition yet. Right. And so um, that's what's cool is that um, – so nobody's really got to hear from these kids yet. And so we're going to have Emily, who was one of those kids, uh, come to the UFO Congress to speak. Uh, she did do a, a conference, a small conference, a similar kind of thing recently – well, a few months ago in, in Canada – but uh, this will be then the first time in the U.S., and, and um, we are really excited about it. I got to meet her a few months ago, uh. and she um, – kind of like last year we had the Allagash guys, and uh, we've got a really good documentary kind of uh, thing coming out pretty soon for YouTube for free uh, on the Allagash. But these guys had their experiences, and their art changed. They were all artists. Well, same with Emily. She's now doing art that she feels is kind of an expression of the messages she received um, back then because these kids feel they receive these telepathic messages. So it's really extraordinary, and I'm so excited for people to see her artwork and um, hear her stories because uh, that is an incredible case. And a lot of people who uh, have – read about or seen anything about the case are really enthusiastic about it yeah you're right and and just because you hear stories where children describe something or you hear so many more stories where uh young adults and older adults who now refer to themselves as experiencers okay it's almost it's like a sub culture context of the whole ufo community so many people now have been coming forward and telling stories of their encounters with some kinds of beings <clears throat> it's so easy for hardcore skeptics and debunkers to jump on these people well you can't prove what happened and you know you can't even give us a picture it's just you know maybe it was just nothing but a bad dream that you had or you know the debunkers will always do and say whatever they can to to well spin and dirty tricks there it is you know to to make people feel ridiculed to the point where they, they they never want to tell their stories anymore and i think jacques valet is probably one of those scientists who who is is totally against this kind of debunking and ridicule and we're going to get into that on stage at the congress mm-hmm. really exciting so we're out yeah. of time but thank you so much for coming on and talking about all of this um thank you it's become – well, I think it's been really informative. It was kind of like a, a, a big UFO Congress uh, advertisement, but we're both so excited <laughs> about it. I mean this is some really cool stuff um, that's going to be happening, and it's kind of funny because I don't know uh, – well, you were kind of like this because you didn't get to come last year. And it's kind of funny because it, it, in a way – and it's not to be mean. It's fun when um, – the conference, you get people there that people really want to see to where they want to come so bad mm-hmm. at where it hurts that they're not there. And it's not that I want them to hurt because they're not there. I would rather have them there. Just come yeah. to the con- – the way to get rid of that pain is just <laughs> come to the Congress. And last year, there were a lot of people that were like, I wanted to be there so badly to see yeah. – Bob Lazar, and now this year, you know, already people are posting, oh, my gosh, I want to be there so bad. Well, you know what? The way to resolve it is to come to the conference. It's, it's to somehow get there and and book your hotel rooms because you want to be able to stay within 50 miles <laughs> of the yeah, conference. because, <laughs> you know, they, the, the nearby conference or rooms start to book up, so um, yeah. people want to come. And, you know, one good option for people, too, is there are rooms that aren't too far away, like maybe 20 minutes for, uh, mm-hmm. for like, 50 bucks a night. So you could that, – that cheap, you could rent a car 
and stay there and you know save money yeah well i'm looking forward to seeing everybody um let's let's just remind everybody that we're talking about what guinness world records calls the largest the biggest ufo conference in the world love that and uh, i think i think i think this year or next year may be really truly one of the biggest because of of jacques Vallée. yeah and not, yeah it's absolutely yeah well thank you so much for being on the show but thank you so much for for uh thinking of us and and for um you know making this happen i think uh race hobbs who runs KGRA. I saw him post on Facebook. Thank you, Lee, because I think you guys have talked. Uh, but yeah, thank you for, for making this happen. And of course, uh, I always love seeing you. It's going to be so cool uh, to have yes. you there. Yes, it's going to be great. I, I always enjoy seeing you. And uh, you're like my long lost brother. <laughs> Thank you so much to Lee Spiegel for being on the show again. It's always a ton of fun. And thank you, of course, to Martin Willis uh, for joining us uh, every week uh, from UFO Podcast to talk about the news. Um, If you want to hear more about uh, Lee, you can go to the UFO Congress website and uh, go to the speaker page and you'll see uh, Jacques Vallée and Lee and Emily and... Um, all of our other amazing speakers. And uh, be sure, you know, to join our email list if you haven't already. We only send out emails bi weekly, it's an email newsletter. Once in a while, we'll send out another email email a special one if we have any news such as you know Jacques Vallée joining the conference or something like that so we don't send it uh, we don't blitz you with emails however it's a good way to keep up to date with Open Mind UFO Radio with the UFO Report with our hot stories going on and with the UFO Congress because we give you updates on all of that in our newsletter so you can get the newsletter by going to openminds.tv and in the upper right hand corner you'll see the join the email list box where you could submit your email address or you can email us at contact at openminds.tv and say hey add me to your email list and we'll do it uh so it's that simple uh to do that so uh please do join the list because that keeps you up to date on everything and we have pretty much i would say 99 percent of our speakers listed there's only one speaker we don't have listed yet however uh you know and that's what's exciting about this year it's our 20th anniversary and it's really shaping up to be a stellar year at the ufo congress what with jacques Vallée and emily trim uh you know we have another of other great chase Chase Kletsky, who's just really cool, uh, great researcher. John Greenwald and Barbara Lamb. Uh, We've got Dr. David Jacobs, who, of course, is a a well-known and important person in the field. We have Dr. Claude Swanson, who you probably haven't heard of, although those of you who have listened to my show for a long time, uh, he was one of my, if not the first interview I did, one of my very first when I had, when this used to be called the UFO Think Tank, before the existence of Open Mind. So uh, some of you may be familiar with him. If you're not, you will be pleasantly surprised uh, with his talk. He's a theoretical physicist. He uh, went to, he worked at MIT. I think he even got a degree there. But uh, really cool guy, some really amazing stuff talking about the technology, the science of UFO propulsion uh, and how it ties into other paranormal phenomena. So, you know, uh, it could even, I think he kind of explains, explain, you know, ghosts or, or psychic abilities and stuff like this. Really cool stuff. Dr. Ron Westrom, a psychologist in sociology, or I mean a, a former professor of sociology who talks about how uh, he examines how in the past there have been scientific phenomena or phenomena natural phenomena or real phenomena that had occurred that people didn't believe were real and uh, what it took for them to uh, and the scientific community to demonstrate that this was a real phenomena and he's going to 
parallel that to the UFO field and to show how we're going through a similar sort of process. Um, so that's really interesting. Just a lot of really, really cool stuff. And we'll highlight more of these speakers. Nick Pope we're going to have. Um, we're going to highlight more of these speakers um, in the emails as time goes by, but you'll be able to see that in the speaker list. So yeah, all but one speaker is listed. And like I said, we've had some huge announcements uh, what with the speakers that we're having. And this last speaker, once we have it all confirmed and worked out, we just don't list people until we have it all confirmed and worked out. It's going to be another doozy. You're going to be extremely excited about it. Uh, like I am. So another doozy, another really, really cool uh, speaker. So this is going to be a stellar year. So be sure to sign up. Uh, let us know if you need anything. Uh, you can email. Just so you know, you can contact us by telephone. But to be completely honest, we're very busy and uh, we might not answer the phone because there's only a couple of us here. And of course, I'm writing stories, I'm doing the radio show, all this other stuff. So often I'll have to let it go to voicemail and I'll get back with you and I will get back with you. However, we can answer uh, emails a little more quickly. So if you email us, uh, that would be preferable to calling. But uh, still, call if you need to, no problem. Anyway, thank you to everybody who helped out with the show. Lee Spiegel was awesome as usual. Uh, also, what was awesome as usual was the opening and close music provided by Caleb Hanks. He's awesome. You could get a link to his site, uh, The Cook Chronicles, at the Open Minds UFO Radio page on openminds.tv. And also, thank you to you all. That's it's just a absolute pleasure to meet you all like I do occasionally at these conferences. Uh, it's great to meet you uh, at the UFO Congress, so hopefully you can make it. But I hope you all do have a wonderful, wonderful holiday and a great dinner. And I hope you know, I know, family can be annoying. There can be those, those characters. Uh, hopefully you have a great family where you guys really enjoy each other and, and it's wonderful. But practice some patience. Be patient. And I hope that everybody gets along and everybody has a wonderful time. And, you're, and uh, uh, you know, everybody puts aside uh, some of the uh, annoying quirks <laughs> that or <laughs> they don't want to rib you or bug you about when are you going to get married? When are you going to have a kid? It's like, Mom, lay off. You know, I, I know. 